Kelly Moore, thank you very much indeed for coming on to Evolution Soup all the way from Montana. We know you, of course, as one of the presenters of the extremely popular online show Eons, but you're also a collection manager at the University of Montana Paleontology Center, responsible for cataloging over 100,000 fossils there. So uh, how are you doing today, Kelly? Have you been filming a new Eon show or cataloging bones or just relaxing? Yeah, we actually filmed another episode yesterday, which was a lot of fun. So um, I'm excited for that. And then uh, I have been working in the collection. So my normal like nine to five is on campus. And we're kind of gearing up for a couple of different projects right now. Um, mm. Yeah, uh, I had a uh, alumni from the 80s who did her master's thesis on some Permian rocks in Montana donate her full thesis collection specimens. So all of these need to be inventoried and curated into the actual collection. And there was quite a few of them. So uh, we have our work cut out for us for the next couple of months. We're going to be talking about eons, of course, as well as your work as the fossil librarian, as we know you on Instagram. Uh, before all of that, let's just find out a bit about you. Uh, how did you feel about paleontology when you were growing up? Was it something you thought you might actually end up doing? Yeah, uh, I I was into paleontology as as soon as, I mean, as early as I can remember. And my dad collected fossils when he was a kid. So he actually had mm. uh, a nice collection of probably Mississippian and Pennsylvanian aged invertebrates from Missouri. And so I always found myself looking through those. And then when I was old enough, I would search the woods behind our house and bring back these huge chunks of limestone. And me and my dad <laughs> would bust them open looking for shells. Um, oh, yeah. and, and so I cut my teeth on invertebrates from the mid continent. And then whenever I got into college, it was kind of strange. I didn't think that like paleontology was an actual career. Like people just did this in the movies or something and not actually yeah. like for a job. So I started college as a secondary education major. I was going to be a biology uh, teacher, a high school biology teacher. And that just wasn't the right way for me at all and so um, I had to take a physical sciences course and it was like my language I understood everything that they were saying I was just like oh this this is it these are my people and I changed my major over with a minor in paleontology as mm. soon as soon as that first class got out and and it's been that way ever since Okay, uh, let's talk about the Eon Show. This is an internet-based show of short science documentaries produced by PBS Digital, and you present the episodes along with Hank Green and Blake DePastino, and these are really great ways to digest science in a fun way. You've had episodes on dinosaurs, uh, human evolution, climate, plant life, and they get hundreds of thousands and often millions of views. I think your most popular one was the um, the Megalodon one, the giant shark. Isn't that oh right? my gosh, yes. Thank goodness for that movie just coming out. I am sure <laughs> that we got a major bump from basically anybody watching a trailer for the Meg got a um, it got a suggestion to see our video after that. So we got a huge bump. Like that, that video was going along normal and then all of a sudden hmm. it spiked and it just keeps spiking and it, it kind of throws all of our analytics off because it's yeah. still performing well but who knew but hopefully uh if you've seen the comment section there's still not a lot of people that believe that the meg is extinct so we're we're doing our due diligence we're trying to uh, make the do they believe it's real though <laughs> yeah they believe it's real but they also believe that a 65 foot shark could handle the pressures at the bottom of the ocean which uh, mm. i don't think so but um but yeah so we're trying but yeah so eons is actually produced by a company here in missoula called uh complexly that also does the side mm. shows and crash courses um but yeah. it's owned and funded by pbs so it's a partnership 
Kelly, I think it'd be really cool to find out how an episode of Eons is made. So let's go through it, uh, start to finish, from initial brainstorming right through to the final upload. Right. So it obviously starts with our writers. Um, writers that have uh, written for us before have the opportunity to pitch us episodes, something that they're comfortable with. A lot of our uh, writers are professional paleontologists. They're in the field or paleoanthropologists. And so they usually write to their strengths, which makes us hmm. feel good. We have the experts writing our episodes. But we also have science communicators and science writers, journalists that focus on science writing. So if you're an old writer, you can pitch us episodes. If you're a new writer, sometimes what we do is we have this long list of episode ideas and we'll actually pitch you. We would really like to have an episode on this. Let's see how you can handle it. Um, so the writing process is probably the longest part of an Eons episode. It can take mm. up to several months sometimes wow. to develop a script because if you've watched Eons long enough, you know that we have this this theme, this this storyline. Every single episode has a beginning, middle, and end, and it wraps up very nicely. And so to get, you know, a bullet point of facts into this narrative is kind of challenging sometimes. Um, and so it goes back and forth between the writer and Blake or Darcy, our co-editor, they go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Once the episode, uh, the script is basically done, I would say 80 to 90% complete, it comes to me for fact checking. So then I go through every single line of the script basically and double check that what we're saying is correct. And I've missed a couple of things here and there, but we're all just humans. Um, and yeah. we have a really great community in the comment section that will let us know immediately, um, yes. usually within the hour of posting an episode if we had something a little incorrect. So um, I, I do really love our commenters. So, uh, so yeah, so it comes to me, I fact check. Uh, once I give it the green light and I think it's good enough, uh, then it goes in into the world. So whoever is up next, Blake, Hank, and I just, um, cycle whoever is available like right now blake is at a meeting um and and gets to go to gsa it just so happened that his oh. meeting for complexly <laughs> was in phoenix and so he got to go to a couple of the days of gsa um but since he wasn't around i filmed yesterday so it's just kind of whoever's available whoever's um all, available. Yeah. yeah all the hosts are here in missoula so that makes it kind of easy other than i mean hank is in missoula but he is a busy busy man so um he probably hosts the least maybe just just once a month if he's not like on a book tour or something. Uh, so we film here in Missoula. I'm actually in our podcast studio right now. This is Complexly Wide comp uh, uh, Podcast Studio, um, but Eons has our own studio across the hallway. So we shoot in front of a green screen. And if you've noticed in some of our episodes, we use the host as a scale bar. So to be able to oh, do yeah. that, yeah, it, it's such, oh my gosh, when we were developing this show, I, that was, that just, oh my God, that made my year when they were like, well, we could probably use the host maybe as a scale bar. And I was like, yes, I'm going to get to be a scale <laughs> bar. So I think even in that Meg episode, I was the scale bar for Meg. Lifelong Robot. ambition. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I was really excited about it. I'm still really, every time it happens in an episode, I'm just like, God, this is amazing. Um, so just for any of you watching out there, I'm like five, six and a half. So <laughs> to give you an idea, I don't think we ever say how tall I am when I'm a scale bar. Um, so uh, we shoot in front of a green screen. And to get a scale bar, you actually have to film vertically instead of in mm. um, a horizontal frame. So we actually shoot all of our episodes vertically. So the whole host is there, feet to top of the head. And we shoot in 4K, which is terrifying, um, but we nobody sees that 4K um, footage except for our post-production team. And then, but we shoot in 4K so we can zoom in on the host and still be able to publish at HD. So then, uh, it, yeah, so our post-production team is actually in Indianapolis. So we shoot all that raw footage gigabytes. I mean, it's so many gigs of raw footage that goes to 
um, our post-production team that cuts it, puts the music in. Um, I help source and find images and we cut it all together. We get the draft episode. Um, the crew looks at the draft episodes, makes suggestions, goes back and forth, back and forth. We send it to PBS. They give us the green light and we post. So that's the quick and dirty of how an Eons episode is made. <laughs> And then how long do you guys have to wait before you actually see it? Are you sort of on tender hooks waiting for it to the final product? And um, I mean, I our post-production team, Seth, is a wizard. And I know that everything that he does is going to look amazing. So really, it's just the anticipation of seeing it, seeing what he did with it. Um, it takes like two weeks give or take depending on if we have problems getting an image or getting usage rights or um, mm -hmm. if we have to actually have an artist uh, make a reconstruction for us or if we need any animations that can kind of slow it down a little bit for the most part it takes about two weeks so actually the episode that either we'll post today or tomorrow um, will be our hundredth episode ah yeah fantastic so that's really exciting. Because um, I know some of the pictures are in public domain. You see mm -hmm. them, uh, you know, Wikipedia, things like that. But oh, yeah. other ones, they have a bit of motion to them. Uh, are these are ones that you make yourselves? So uh, we do look for public domain images a lot. I mean, those are the easiest ones to use. And um, the cutoff right now is like 1924 for most publications. So um, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about was found and described originally in the early 1900s. So a lot of times we can use the original mm. um, descriptions or uh, reconstructions or even line drawings of the actual specimens. Um, sometimes the, the creature has literally never been reconstructed before. And so we go to um, Franz Anthony at Studio 252 MYA. Um, Franz or his team are the ones that we usually commission for artwork. Um, then there is a little bit of motion that can be added, either kind of zooming in or panning out, or mm. uh, every once in a while there's like a ripple effect. And I think that that's just a post-production effect that Seth can put on these images um, to give it a little bit more or, um, kind of movement to keep the eye um, entertained while you watch them. Yeah, they certainly look beautiful anyway. So, um, yeah, really looking forward to the, the 100th episode. Yeah, and I, I don't think we even mentioned that it's our 100th episode. We, um, after we filmed it, Seth was like, oh, uh, if, if my count is correct, that should have been our 100th episode. But um, we don't even mention anything about it in, in the actual episode, but we might put something in the description. Um, for that, but yeah. At Eons, you must rely on the video's comment section a lot. In fact, recently you aired an episode based on the public's most requested subject, didn't you? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was the evolution of bats. Uh, mm. we, we do tend to pull from our audience. I mean, that's who we make these episodes for, are the people that are watching it, obviously. And so, um, we take their comments into effect and a lot most of the comments that we have are episode ideas and there are some really good ones out there um sometimes it takes us a little while to create these episodes because you know we got the evolution of blood oh my gosh like the same commenter would comment on every single episode for months and months and months and months and then it like became a thing it like it took on its own life or something wow. and people started upvoting it and so if you go back into our catalog for a while the very first like comment uh, uh, that has been upvoted is the evolution of blood I'm just going to keep asking until you guys do it. And so finally, finally we did it. But it took a while to develop that episode. The evolution of blood is not an easy topic. Um, the same thing with bats. We don't have a lot of information. And so we kind of held off on it because the whole episode is like, I don't know. I I don't know what's happening with the bats. They show There's up. There's nothing wrong with that, though, is there? That's, that's no. the thing. In science, you can say we don't know yet, and maybe we'll never know. Yeah, and so when we first started the channel, those types of open-ended questions kind of like irked Blake a little bit. Like he wanted an answer. Like he wanted to tell the audience, like this is what happened and these are how these animals evolved. And so the first episode that we kind of had to come to terms with, like, yeah, this is going to happen a lot more than you think, it was the evolution of snakes episode. Um, and so there's this progression that makes sense in our minds. You go from a four-legged lizard thing to a no-legged snake, and they probably lost their legs 
during that process. So you go from four legs to two legs to no legs, but the fossil record doesn't really show that. And so um, we originally wrote the episode in that order. And then when I started fact checking, it wasn't lining up. And so we kind of had to tweak the whole narrative to mm. being like, it went from ABC to we think it went like this, but here's what the evidence is showing. And here's what that might mean. And I don't know. And so um, I think more often than not, we're getting a lot more comfortable with these open ended questions that we don't know that right now we don't have the ev evidence for it. But usually I feel like if anybody wants something figured out, have us make an episode on it. And within a month, new research is going to come out <laughs> that talks about our episode <laughs> that we just posted. It always seems to happen that um, new research comes out just so, so close to when we actually post an episode about that same topic. So, And do then commenters, certain certain commenters then flock to the comment text section to say, you've got this wrong? And <laughs> Sometimes yes, sometimes no. I mean, if our episode posts before uh, the PopSci article comes out, I mean, there's nothing mm -hmm. that we could do about it. So we try to mention these things. So we have a live stream that we do with our patrons. And part of that live stream is where we talk about new research that's um, associated with an old episode. Uh, so we try to kind of bring that back in during our our uh, patron live stream so we do it and I am assuming that some of, one of these days we'll actually do um, like an updated episode on an older episode Renewal. that's why you have to use language like is thought uh, is thought to be or you know it may be that sort of thing nothing committal yes we use a lot of hedging <laughs> a <laughs> lot of hedging maybe possibly could be yeah um, so we're very rarely definitive on anything we say because paleontology is constantly in flux. I mean, science as a whole mm. is always changing, uh, yeah. but paleo is one that is just very, just, it's so ephemeral basically of what you think yeah. the understanding is. It could change in an hour. We don't know. So, Kelly, you've hosted some of my favorite Eon episodes. Uh, including many human evolution episodes, but which ones are your favorites and which ones cause the most reaction? Who? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, well, man, we've got a hundred episodes, so there's quite a few to choose from. But you know, I have to, I have to admit that my all-time favorite episode to host was the one that we filmed at the Smithsonian's Deep Time Hall. Um, oh, yes. Getting to go into that museum before it was finished, none of the glass was in front of any, any of the big dinosaur mounts. So, I mean, I was all up in that T-Rex taking pictures because there was nothing stopping me. There was no glass. And the episode turned out incredibly beautiful. We had all three hosts in the episode. Um, there's no glare on the cases because there was no glass. Mm. Like it was just amazing. It was so the staff neat. were quite happy to have you there, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. They were excited to have us there. And and this is actually the Smithsonian's kind of idea. They approached PBS about doing something with eons in conjunction with their new deep time hall. And I have to admit when they first brought it up in our team meeting, I about fell out of my chair. I was so <laughs> excited. I I had always wanted to see I'd never been to the Natural History Museum the Smithsonian Natural History Museum and so to get to have my very first time there to get to host an episode after hours there was nobody there we had the whole exhibit unfinished exhibit to ourselves um, and then to come back in uh, a few months later and host the live stream there with it finished and again after hours and I got the whole place to myself was just amazing it was just really amazing and i'm with you though i do like our human evolution episodes a lot because i don't and have not ever really studied human evolution i know you know the kind of the benchmark dates um just in my head but i don't i don't study human stuff i'm a hundred percent animal person and so i have learned the most from those mm. human evolution uh, human evolution episodes for sure because i just i don't know uh, I think it's where we are on the family tree is one you did. It's quite a complex one. Yeah, um, yeah. I like that one a lot. 
I do like that one at the very, very end. I go through like how you're related to everybody and um, you're one of these because of this and you're also this because of this. And I, I do really like that breakdown at the end of the episode that takes you from the start of the episode to the end of the episode. And here's your whole family tree. Um, that was a really neat one. Uh, the one that got the most flack was um, it was one of the it was the episode on the T-Rex. I believe it was like, why? what's up with like T-Rex's tiny arms or something like that. And um, we, there was a couple of mistakes in the episode. One of them was we said it correctly, but the name that we put on screen was incorrect. And so that like freaked everybody out. And, oh, um, and that was just like a whoops, like, dang it, we put an O instead of an I and it just, oh my God, it was a subfamily instead of family or something like that. Um, but later in the episode, we're talking about T-Rex evolution and what like what happened to their arms. I mean, they didn't start out super tiny. So what happened to the longer arm T-Rex? And we mm. used Raptor Rex as one of our examples uh -huh. of, yeah, of, of T-Rex evolution. And I can't remember which date we used, if it was the older date or the younger date. Um, but we didn't say both sides of that story. We just used one date. And we got called out so hard about that. Because um, there's a lot of people that think it was the other date. <laughs> and so um, we actually did a kind of a rebuttal episode about it. And it was, it was so neat how we did this. So we took Raptor X. And um, I think it, the episode's called, Did Raptor X Really Exist? And mm -hmm. we used Raptor X as an example of how we date fossils. So um, it's like, normally we would do this, but we can't do it with Raptor X because of that. So let's try this. Well, we actually can't do that with Raptor X. Well, maybe we could do this. Oh, nope, that still doesn't work with Raptor X. And so we told both sides of the story. We used it as an example of a nightmare dating specimen and worked it all the way out to where we still don't know we're not a hundred percent on the age and we hypothesized a few methods that have not been done yet to possibly get an age for this creature so it kind of turned yeah. out well for us because it got this really unique dating episode like we usually could do um you know like what is dating? Oh, we can do relative dating and we can do radiometric dating, but it was neat to throw all these techniques out, focusing on one specimen that's impossible yeah. to do any of those techniques with. So and it um, shows how interested people are in the fact that it was, I suppose you could say it's been interactive in oh, what happened, what you just described. Yeah, yep, yep. So uh, we do take much we we walk a little bit more on eggshells whenever we talk about charismatic dinosaurs now um because the the fanfare is pretty extreme when you get to um t-rex or any of the raptors or basically any dinosaur that's been in jurassic park um they have a huge following and a very loyal following and a following that knows their stuff and so um they're the darth vader of the uh <laughs> dinosaur world so you gotta get it right yes you do you have to get it right if you're talking about anything with these charismatic dinosaurs and so mm. that was a little mistake on our end and that t-rex episode was one of our earlier episodes so um we've got our system down a little bit better now i guess you'd say that the the fact checking on my end is a little better um the draft checking on the um episodes words images everything go through a much more intense fact checking now so so i hope that we don't run into too much of that anymore but um but yeah those were those were a couple of the episodes that probably got the most like we got the most heat off of. Yeah, for sure. Like on Evolution Soup, I like to talk to people in the sciences, ideally from diverse backgrounds. So what are your thoughts on the sciences and the roles that women, people of color, and those with learning difficulties have in a field that is sometimes seen as mostly white male dominated? Yeah, paleontology has definitely been a white guy field for a really long time. Now, me personally, I surround myself with a lot of female paleontologists. And so mm. I follow a ton of them on Instagram. And so my feed is just full of female scientists. And so 
I feel like my view of science and women in science is completely skewed because the only time I ever see women in science is on my Instagram feed and they're everywhere. They're absolutely everywhere. And so to me, it feels like, hey, we're, we're on the way up. But, you know, women and men have different strengths, I think, sometimes. Sometimes they do. Sometimes they don't. But everybody has different backgrounds. And so you bring different ideas, different ways of thinking um, to problems. And so Mm -hmm. having a diverse background of people, having a diverse uh, group of scientists working on the same problem could possibly be the best brainstorming session of all time because everybody's coming at the problem from a different angle. So I think that science is just going to get better. We're going to do better science and a lot more cool stuff is going to come out. The more people that are doing science and then the more diverse people that are doing science, um, you're just going to have better science. So I can't wait for it to be 50-50, if it's ever 50-50. I mean, it is 60-40 even. Hey, I take it. So um, I think we're getting there. I think it's we're getting a we're getting much closer. I've seen some um, random statistics in pop sci mm. and it's showing that more women than men now are going into science. And I think that's a right. reflection of just how hard, at least in the States that we have pushed girls to get into STEM. Um, and so I think the, now it needs to, we need to stop genderizing it and just be like kids get into STEM, you know? And so we're creating the same problem that we used to create by telling boys that they go into science and girls to go into not science. Um, And so now we're just focusing on women getting into science and not on guys. And so now we're going to start to see the opposite of where it's just going to be a bunch of women scientists. (laughs) We don't want that. We just want it to be more equal. So at some point in time, we've got to stop the pronouns. We've just, I am a scientist. I am not a female scientist. I'm just a scientist. And just be like, kids, science is awesome. Go into science regardless of your gender. Um, And so I think once we get to that point that we can finally Mm. drop the pronouns to where I am not introduced as a woman in science anymore, that we've, we've come full circle. We've done our thing. Absolutely. Callie, it's really great talking to you, and hopefully we can do this again one day. But before we go, let's chat a little bit about anything new and exciting coming up on Eons. Not just mm-hmm. episodes, but I hear there is a, uh, a podcast in the works. Is that right? Yes, I'm so excited about this. Um, so not only do we have our 100th episode posting this week, which uh, I just can't believe it. I can't believe we're already to 100. Um, we've got some interesting topics coming up that I don't think I should say what they are. <laughs> Oh, come on. Give some exclusive. <laughs> oh, some exclusiveness. <laughs> well, by the time this posts, our 100th episode will already be out. And um, it's on uh, giant lemurs of Madagascar. Uh, and oh, we've nice. had a, a lot of, um, probably the next most requested is Australian megafauna. We're getting there, you guys. We are getting there. We are going to do oh, Australian nice. megafauna. Um, so that'll... And still be a lions and all those weird, wonderful yes. And, and I seriously can't believe it has taken us so long to do it, but it's coming. I promise. Um, the podcast is going to be the the title right now. We're working with it a little bit, but it might stick. It's called Way Back, and uh, it'll come out sometime probably later this fall, early winter. We're still kind of working on release dates and contracts and all this stuff, but we have our first episode mostly done. And it's going to be probably Blake and I time traveling. So we start in the present and we work our way back to some amazing point in the ancient past at that location. So is this audio only or video and audio audio only? Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Yep. So video is where the episode is at. Uh, And so the audio will just be, and this is, it's going to be fun, um, less science, and uh, I mean, it's all going to be factually correct, but less explanation, less explainery, and more just like 
me and Blake riffing off of one another as we're cruising around the Cretaceous Seaway or something like that. And I take it um, it will be longer than that, like a typical Eons episode, perhaps half an hour, an hour? Or? And well, yeah. no, probably not that long. Half an hour at the absolute most, probably closer to like 20 minutes uh, for, for right now to kind of test the waters to see how it's received, see if people like it. Um, we're, we're just at we're just kind of testing the waters. PBS wanted to, PBS Digital Studios wanted to branch out. They wanted to do some more things other than just YouTube. And podcasting was kind of the next best, best thing. I mean, the Wild West right now is podcasts. And so it's smart it's smart to have a podcast. Uh, so we're we're trying it out. We'll, we'll see how well it is received. I'm really excited about it. Um, I've, I've got to learn how to not read it like an eons episode uh that's probably one of my biggest personal critiques after listening to the first draft of the episode i sound like i'm on an eons episode and not with blake hanging out in a car on the side of the road type of thing so um so yeah it'll take a little bit to get the feel to get it going but i'm i'm really excited yeah about about the podcast well, all these uh, the episodes that I do here on Evolution Soup, I've been ripping and uploading as audio only, and that was an experiment, which which seems to be working. And I get uh, emails from people saying, "When's the next one coming out? I need it for when I go jogging." So <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be the thing, you know, yeah. or, or long car journeys. You know, sometimes uh, people say, um, "I like the videos, but the audio, I tend to, you know, the uh, the information goes in a bit more for me." Yeah, I know with uh, when I listen to podcasts, um, I, f I usually listen to podcasts actually only in the, the winter time, which is kind of strange, but I ride my, I'm a bike commuter. And so in the summer times I can ride and I, I feel that it's very dangerous to ride with headphones mm. and you, you can't hear what's happening. The car could be screeching towards you and have no idea. Um, so I never ride with headphones in, but at some point in the winter in Montana, it gets to the point where I can't ride my bike anymore and I have to walk. And so podcasts make my walk so much better. I like, I, I get the backlog of all of my podcasts that I haven't listened to all year. And I just go through them uh, on my walks to work. So I totally understand the listening to podcasts um, is, I, I don't know. It's a podcast. I, I mean, video is fun, uh, but listening is definitely easier you don't need your phone you don't need to be watching something it's just oh, i can't wait for this i think it's going to end up being my favorite science <laughs> podcast <laughs> oh i'm excited i'm excited for everybody to hear it um i think it's going to be a lot of fun there was a lot of development we went back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and brainstormed and pitched and brainstormed and pitched and so um now i think we actually have like the list of topics that we're going to cover and we now know how the episodes are going to work and, um, and this back and forth thing. So we actually did three different drafts. Um, well, kind of like mini pitch episodes and mm. shopped them out to everybody in PBS and in complexly to see like, Oh, what do you, which one do you like more? What do you like about it? What don't you like about it? And we did that a couple mm. of times to get feedback into the, this podcast. So, um, we tried really hard at least. So I hope, I hope people like it. If you like eons, I think, um, I think it'll, be a, like it'll be a surefire hit, Kelly. You know it will be. <laughs> you know I it hope will be. so. You never know. You never know. There's a lot of podcasts out there. But uh, we, we tried to do something a little different. A, a little different. Okay, that was really fantastic. Thank you so much for coming onto the channel to talk about your work. Yeah. I, I know we all look forward to the next Eons episode, and I will put links to Eons as well as your own social media details okay. in the description below. And all that's left to say really is thank you, Callie, for championing science, evolution, and evidence. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This is a great discussion. I, I just love talking about ancient life, so this was great. <laughs> Thank you once again. Yep.